The dagger versus armor debate is getting bigger and it's going deeper. Folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria and Eastern Antique Arms. Now, I hope that all of you watching this have seen the previous videos from uh, Todd on Todd's channel and uh, myself being the, the stabbing person, uh, testing out various types of materials against Rondel Daggers. And now, Nathan and Craig over at Arms and Armour Inc. Uh, in the United States have um, done a brilliant video that I've just finished watching and in fact I also communicated with Todd uh, today as well on this very subject. So it seems that this has got a lot of interest. Unsurprisingly I would say because anyone who's interested in armour is going to be interested in this question. Anybody who's interested in HEMA and medieval weapons is also going to be interested in this question. Obviously if you're interested in both then uh, it's very very pertinent to you. Now um, I suggest I'm going to put a link below to all of the previous videos. So um, Todd's original video that um, he did with me uh, on screen. I did a follow-up video um, where I shared some of my thoughts and I'm going to share the video on uh, Arms and Armour's channel with uh, Nathan and Craig where they share a, a bunch of really, really um, useful thoughts, uh, decades of experience that they've got and also they did some tests with one of their rondel daggers against some similar materials to what we did, mail and plate, and got some quite different results and people are already asking me, hey Matt, What's up with that? Why are their results so different uh, to yours and Todd's? And the answer is, we don't know. We clearly need to do a bunch more testing and you can uh, bet your bottom dollar that we will be doing that uh, in one form or another. I'm definitely going to be meeting up with Todd to doing some more stuff with him. I might do a little bit of stuff on my own channel as well. Um, I've got different mail, I've got different types of plate lying around. I've even got some sacrificial armour which might be used at some point. Um, and maybe, you know, and this is kind of call out, if you are involved with armour manufacture um, or you're indeed, you've just got some spare bits of armour, maybe that might, might be useful for future testing. Of all types, we want to test different types of um, uh, iron and steel, mild steel, carbon steel, hardened carbon steel versus, you know, we'll, different thicknesses, different shapes, this kind of stuff. We Hopefully we'll get to that at some point in the future. But Watching uh, Nathan and Craig's uh, Arm and, Arms and Armour um, channel, link below, um, video, I scribbled down a few thoughts, which I'm not going to go into huge depth with here. I'm just going to give you my first thoughts. So if we divide this debate down into attack being the dagger and defence being the armour or whatever's being stabbed, armour, it could be clothing as well. Um, so... There are a few things I think we need to address and question when we're looking at the attack. Uh, for example, the material. What exactly is the blade made of? Okay, um, and how's it hardened? We know, so certainly I know, and uh, certain other people will know, that in the 19th century, certain types of steel were prized for certain tasks. A lot of people talk about sheer steel. There were certain types of steel that were used for uh, specific types of tool. For example, um, ice axes or shears, uh, shears for cutting different types of metal. So there were different types of steel uh, made up of uh, different composition, different uh, proportions of elements that were preferred for specific tasks. Now it could be, this is just purely floating an idea, it could be that there are certain types of steel that for this specific tool, and maybe Todd by chance has happened on it, work notably better than other types of steel um, because it's a very specific tool and we'll come back to that point. So that's just a first thought. Feel free to discuss below um, on that point. The second thing is sharpness. Now, I've stabbed and shot a lot of things into a lot of other things in my life and my opinion is that the fineness of the edge is very important to penetration, very much on all of the materials that we tested, whether it's fabric, uh, in multiple layers, whether it's mail, which we cut through, um, whether that's iron, mild steel, whatever, we cut through it. We didn't burst the ring, we cut through it. So presumably sharpness plays a part. And definitely when we tested with the arrowheads, daggers, swords, anything else on sheet steel, the sharpness or fineness of the edge, acuteness of the edge is also very important. And connected to that point, my next one is shape, cross-section. Now Nathan and Craig touched on this cross-sectional shape. 
Is it that a hollow ground edge has some effect that we hadn't necessarily appreciated the importance of before? Possibly. Um, perhaps it reduces friction. I think that's very likely because if you think about it now, a hollow ground edge, a triangular hollow ground section blade, is only in contact at the points and not on the flat surface with the thing that it's penetrating potentially. So cross-sectional shape, hugely important, and we know that rondel daggers came in a number of very specifically designed cross-sectional shapes. Sometimes they were more square, sometimes more triangular, sometimes they were diamond double-edged, but they often have these specific shapes, which hint at the fact that in the medieval and Renaissance periods, they were designing these cross-sections for specific jobs and things in mind. And again, I'll come back to that at the end of the, this particular video. And finally, and I'm reluctant to mention this point um, because it sounds like I'm trying to blow my own trumpet because um, I stabbed something quite deeply, but I'm, this isn't it. Uh, it's not me trying to blow my own trumpet, but I do think we've got to consider body mechanics, okay? Now, uh, Todd acknowledges this, that we often come down to mass times velocity or mass times velocity squared when we're looking at the effects on a target, okay? It's possible, uh, having been hit by lots of people in my life, it's possible that some stars aligned of body mechanics in the test that we did that somehow aren't working in tests that other people are doing, okay? So sometimes it's to do with mass and that, as we showed, sometimes I put the gauntlet on and we noticed we got slightly deeper penetration. My assumption was because I'm adding more mass to my hand, but we also have to remember velocity and acceleration play an important part here. Now, I have spent the last 25 years of my life hitting people with swords and other things, um, and it has been noted that I have the capacity to hit quite hard. So I'm not saying that this is definite, and I'm not saying that, you know, someone else, uh, Nathan or anyone else, is hitting less hard than me. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that we should consider it as a possible point, that perhaps if someone like Bruce Lee, for example, can deliver a one-inch punch, they presumably would be able to stab a knife into a target more deeply than a typical person. That's just something I think we should consider. Therefore, in some tests I've been planning to do with a different type of weapon and a different type of armor, I've been actually looking at having several different people use the weapon so that we can see, you know, do those people deliver the weapon differently to the target? I think that's another thing which I don't think many other people have mentioned so far, but I think we should consider it in future tests. Um, now, in terms of the armor, Obviously, and this has been talked about loads, so I'm not going to belabor the point, but the male quality and type is hugely, uh, when we're talking about chain mail or male, has a huge effect on what happens to it, okay? Clearly, we know that uh, male can be different sizes, the, the, you know, the ring's different diameters. It can be different cross-section, it can be round, it can be flat, it can be rectangular, it can be square. Um, obviously, it can be made of different materials, iron of different qualities, work-hardened, not work-hardened, mild steel. Uh, it can be carbon steel, it can be hardened, blah, blah, blah. So there's a huge variety in the male, and there was in period as well. So, my summing up points that I really want to um, hammer home here and emphasize is, as a historian, so before, before I was ever someone who trained with weapons and trained other people with weapons and had a YouTube cha channel and all that kind of stuff, I was, by training, a historian and an archeologist. So for a second, if I put all of my HEMA to one side, I put all of my YouTube to one side, and knowing all these wonderful people like uh, Nathan and Craig and Todd and all of these cool people, if I put all of that to the side and I just go, okay, put my pure historian and archeologist hat on. First of all, we know for an absolute fact that in history, male, commonly known as chain male in the modern world, came in a, a wide variety of qualities, okay? We um, see written sources describing male being valued at different amounts and being uh, valued not only in terms of money, but valued in terms of its quality to varying degrees. There was clearly cheap male, and there was super expensive male, and there was everything in between. We know that there was male of different sizes, different materials, sometimes hardened, usually not, sometimes iron, sometimes steel. This is all mentioned in historical documents. And um, so therefore we know that not all male would perform the same. Now, if we've got good male, that suggests that there is a need for good male. 
And we see the mention of double mail as well. We're not necessarily certain what double mail means, but most people assume it means two layers of mail. If you are bothering, if you look at Pietro Monte, to specify that someone needs double mail for their collar, that suggests that single mail isn't adequate. Equally, if you have hardened steel mail or just steel mail, that suggests that that achieves things that iron mail doesn't always. Okay, So the very fact that we've got this absolute wealth of historical evidence showing that there was hardcore mail, that suggests that hardcore mail can do something that normal mail or cheap mail doesn't. Okay, Very important data point. The second headline I want you to go away from with is about the rondel dagger. It is an utterly specialised type of dagger. This wouldn't exist if it wasn't intended for a very specialised task. Now, some people will go, oh, it's just for stabbing in the gaps. Well, in, you know, in plate armour, in plate harness. And of course, my answer to that is, well, what's in the gaps? And usually what's in the gaps is male. But... There is some artistic evidence of these going through plate as well, uh, which my friend Zach Evans on his channel has recently shown. Uh, and you could argue that's just, you know, that's artistic license. That's fine. I'm happy to leave that to the side. But the fact is that this is an utterly specialised tool. It's got a specialised hilt. It's got a specialised type of blade. They often have insanely thick blades. They often have very particular point and edge geometry. So if they are designed so specifically and so uniquely as a weapon throughout history and across the world, they must have been doing something that other daggers and knives couldn't do. And quite simply, my experience, although I haven't yet tested this, is if we take something like this uh, Feb and Sykes dagger from World War II, an original World War II example that I've just acquired, would I ha think that this would get through male armour? most of the time, absolutely not, no. And I was very, very surprised to see how the rondel dagger went through the male armour. Now, whether it would always go through male armour has yet to be found out, and obviously uh, Nathan's experience would suggest not, and I think other people out there as well would suggest that some male will stop this. But the fact that this rondel dagger exists is almost proof in itself that it does work against some things that another type of dagger or knife would not work against. Otherwise, the rondel dagger wouldn't exist. The fact that it exists suggests that it does something that other daggers just don't do. Reaches the parts that other parts, <laughs> other knives won't reach. Right, so there we go. I hope that's been interesting. I am massively uh, looking forward to your comments and your further thoughts about this. I have never wanted people to go away from Todd and my tests saying, oh, well, that just shows, you know, armour doesn't work. What's the point of it? You know, clearly armour works. Just as I've said for the Ronald Dagger, armour worked and had huge amounts of money poured into it because it did work most of the time against most things. We're always dealing with exceptional and unusual circumstances here when something that usually works is shown to not work in a specific circumstance, that doesn't mean that it doesn't still work in 95% of other circumstances. So armour works, but also rondel daggers work. Also, certain types of arrowhead and crossbowhead work uh, in the given circumstances. So it's all about finding out what is the context, what is the scenario in which that very particularly and uh, des uh, you know, particular design, something that's had a huge amount of effort put into it, what are the circumstances in which that really excels? And that's what these tests are about. Anyway, looking forward to your comments underneath. Check out all of the links I've stuffed under this <laughs> under this video. There's a lot of them there, and um, I I'm massively looking forward to exploring this topic more. Thanks especially also to Craig and Nathan for your offer of hospitality and your further thoughts on this and your huge experience weighing in on this topic because it is a really good one. And isn't it great that the Rondel Dagger, I feel, is finally getting the attention that it actually deserves? Because for late medieval warfare, 14th to 16th centuries, the Rondel Dagger is a super important weapon. So it deserves more love. Uh, so check out those links below. I hope I'll see you back on the channel soon. Looking forward to your comments. Like and share as you always do. And I hope you're subscribed because there's going to be a lot more interesting content coming up really soon. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.